Whether it runs through our favorite parks or from our kitchen taps, clean water is essential. Thankfully, rivers and streams that supply our water today are the cleanest they've been in generations. However, as recently as the 1950s and 60s, our rivers were on fire as we dumped toxic waste into our waters at an unimaginable scale. From liquid wastes discharged by factories and mills, from a careless use of insecticides and other poisons, from the acid drainage of active or worked out mines, from the black silt washed away when coal is cleaned before shipping, from the erosion of tons of precious soil carried away to become useless polluting silt, and from the discharge of vast quantities of raw, untreated sewage from our cities and towns. At the same time, a new environmental movement was ignited, growing in strength with each passing year. It culminated in the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency in 1970. Just two years later, Congress passed the Clean Water Act, giving us far-reaching protections we enjoy today. The Clean Water Act lays out a path and a process to achieve fishable, swimmable waters. The act starts with a goal. To restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's waters. Then, the act lays out what's needed to provide that goal to eliminate the discharge of pollutants and to achieve water quality, which provides for the protection and propagation of fish, shellfish, and wildlife, and provides for recreation in and on the water. It's the job of federal, state, and local governments working together to achieve the goal of the Clean Water Act. They're charged with recognizing the ways in which we use our waters and adopting water quality criteria that safeguard those uses. They also have the responsibility to implement plans and protections to ensure water quality criteria are met. The Clean Water Act requires that states, territories, and authorized tribes recognize our water's uses as well as the criteria needed to meet those uses. We use our waterways to meet a wide range of needs, from drinking water supply to hydroelectric power. Through the Act's designated use process, states are tasked with setting goals to protect the most sensitive uses. At minimum, they were required to designate uses for all streams to support aquatic life, wildlife, and recreation. Ultimately, states have a duty to protect all existing uses, all the ways our communities depend on our waters, whether or not the water quality is ideal. Any use that is reasonably attainable for a particular body of water, whether it exists or not, must be designated by the state and reflected in state water quality standards. Like the waters themselves, the ways we use them are layered and water uses can be categorized differently from state to state. Aquatic life use, for example, is one type that is broadly shared, but some states have more specific uses based on species of fish, such as warm water or cold water fishes, or those that migrate versus those that are stocked. Ultimately, water uses must be designated for the most vulnerable type of fish. Recreational uses work in similar ways. Some segments of our waterways are designated for secondary contact recreation, which includes activities like boating, where the chance of ingesting water is fairly low. Others are designated for primary contact activities, like swimming and kayaking, for which waters need to be held to a cleaner standard. Water quality standards include different criteria to ensure our uses can be met, especially the uses most sensitive to pollution. Criteria can be physical, chemical, or biological. 
physical criteria describes the water's flow and visibility and whether it's hampered by sediment and floating debris. Chemical criteria include dissolved oxygen, the level of oxygen available for aquatic life, as well as the presence of any toxic substances. Finally, biology describes the balance of life in the water, from the spawning of fish to the presence of harmful bacteria. States are charged with monitoring all of these factors regularly to keep swimming, aquatic life, and other designated uses protected. Our states have designated uses and criteria to support those uses, which the EPA has approved for inclusion in official water quality standards. So how do we achieve and enforce those standards? The Clean Water Act requires that each state adopt what's called an anti-degradation plan. An anti-degradation plan, put simply, is a series of action steps and legal measures designated to keep healthy waters thriving. These plans can also be designated to get impaired waters back on track. An anti-degradation plan works in two ways. Through pollution permits that limit both the number of pollution sources and the levels of waste and runoff that industries and municipalities are allowed to release into our waterways. Second, plans can help protect landscapes that touch the water, keeping some forests and natural land next to streams from being overdeveloped. Even with standards, permits, and plans in place, Many waters in the United States are polluted or impaired, many falling short of the criteria that people and wildlife need to thrive in and on the water. Every two years, states are required to issue a report on water quality. Waters that don't meet the standards get placed on a remedial list, known as the 303D or the Impaired Waters List. Every three years, states reevaluate their water quality standards through what is known as the Triennial Review. All of these processes, from setting standards and implementing anti degradation plans to issuing permits, assessing waters, and reviewing standards, work to keep our state governments accountable for clean water. These processes also point out where more advocacy and conservation work can be done. Anytime a state evaluates or enforces standards is an opening for the public to get involved. If you participate in a stream monitoring program and the data you're collecting doesn't quite match the state's findings, or if you've seen uses taking place in your waters that are not designated or protected, let your state agency know and put your claim on record. Everyone should have access to swimmable, fishable, and drinkable waters. And it's our responsibility to keep the promise of the Clean Water Act alive for the next generation.